Our next speaker is president of the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. As a researcher, he has developed life-saving drugs, which are used worldwide for the treatment of high blood pressure and congestive heart failure. He also pioneered gene therapy for vascular disease, being the first to introduce DNA decoy molecules to block transcriptions as gene therapy in humans. He is an internationally acclaimed leader in healthcare innovation. I think we can all agree he is in a great position to tell us about the pathway from basic science to better lives. Please welcome Victor Zhao. Well, thank you, Guy, for inviting me to this very important meeting. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, my assignment is to talk about basic science and how it can better lives. And that's really quite easy. Because if you look at the next slide, just life expectancy, over the last century, there's nearly a doubling of life expectancy as shown in this slide. And this doubling clearly is related to improved hygiene, nutrition, uh, quality of life, but importantly, in advancement of science, and of course, the introduction of better diagnostics, treatment and prevention. Next slide. I'm a cardiologist, and in the last 50 years, as shown in this slide, mortality from cardiovascular disease has dropped by 50%. This slide maps to you all the different important uh, advances, scientific advances, throughout the course of the last 50 years. As you can see dramatically, there are the introduction of HMG coi reductase inhibitor statins in 1976, the use of ACE inhibitors in 1985 onwards, and more recently, the drug eluting stent and many others. These brand advances are all dependent on basic research that's translated to clinical medicine. Next slide. So let's stay with cardiovascular, statins. In 1970s, Dr. Endo from Japan discovered from fungi a strong inhibitor of uh, HMJ coil reductase, which as you can see is a critical enzyme in the cholesterol biosynthesis pathway. He demonstrated that this compound reduced cholesterol in dogs and subsequently was able to treat patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, which respond well to a compound. Next slide. About the same time, Brown and Goldstein, who both won the Nobel Prize for their work, identified the LDL receptor. Turns out LDL receptor is a very important mechanism to clear LDL cholesterol from circulation. And of course, the use of HMG uh, inhibitor statins resulted in an upregulation LDL receptor, which further enabled the compound to clear cholesterol from circulation. They also demonstrated that in fact, in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia, that is a mutation LDL receptor that resulted in the inability to clear LDL cholesterol and hence the disease. What you see in the slide are the major statin clinical trials that shown the use of statins significantly reduce cardiovascular deaths and morbidity uh, by reducing cholesterol. Next slide. The other really important area is the renal angiotensin system. Shown in this slide is the cascade of renal angiotensin, starting with angiotensinogen, which is a very important substrate from the liver, which is cleaved by renin, released by the kidney into circulation to make angiotensin 1, which is a decapeptide, which is then converted by an enzyme throughout the body endothelial cells called converting enzyme or ACE to angiotensin 2, the octopeptide, which activates receptors that result in blood pressure regulation salt retention, et cetera. So it became quite obvious based on animal studies that inhibition of this system from, you know, would greatly reduce blood pressure and improve cardiovascular outcomes. Next slide. In the very early days, 1970s, I had the privilege of working with Dr. Haber uh, as a postdoc and then work independently myself to show evidence that blocking renal angiotensin system will in fact reduce blood pressure. This paper published in Science 
is administration of antibodies, which we raise to purify renin and as resulting in indeed reduction of blood pressure. Now, this was before uh, an oral drug was available. Next slide. Another basic research based on the observation of Brazilian Viper, Bathros geraca, uh, showed that in fact, the enzyme which the Viper release in its uh, venom is actually inhibits ACE. Uh, and ACE in fact being responsible for uh, production of angiotensin II result in significant drop in blood pressure by the prey, the victims, if you will, of the viper, and hence, therefore, resulting in paralysis. This led to the observation, therefore, that one can inhibit ACE, and Cushman and Ondetti, shown on the right-hand side, came up with a synthetic mechanism of creating ACE inhibitor. This is using carboxypeptidase as a model. Once you have the availability of, of the oral ACE inhibitor, next slide, it becomes obvious that one can therefore test out the usefulness in cardiovascular disease. I was very fortunate as a young faculty to be involved with this study, led the study which showed for the first time its usefulness in congestive heart failure. And of course, subsequently, many other studies have shown its usefulness in congestive heart failure and hypertension and also in post myocardial infarction. Next slide. So this slide shows you that statins and ACE inhibitors both derived from basic research, an interesting one from fungi and the other one from uh, snake viper, actually are now the most commonly used drugs in the world with over two, 300 million prescriptions a year, saving up to 12 to 10 to 12 or 15% of cardiovascular death. And of course, now there are more also other inhibitors such as receptor antagonists for angiotensin and also renin inhibitors. Next slide. So you can see how basic science is so helpful, certainly in the cardiovascular area. I'd like now to use a few other examples of how it's been useful in clinical translation, leading to better lives. Immunology, gene editing, and regenerative medicine and biology. Next slide. So Jules Hoffman won Nobel Prize for this discovery, where he actually looked at fruit flies, again, at basic research, apparent no relevance to a human in the beginning, but he found that fruit flies, Drosophila, is able to respond to invading organism by a mechanism of protection, which we now know as innate immunity. Next slide. It does so through the it's circulating blood cells, neutrophils, and others by a family of pattern recognition receptors, uh, one of which is toll-like receptor family members. These receptors recognize peptide lipoproteins and RNAs, whereby it responds to the invading organism, activate NF-kappa B and other um, regulatory genes, that resulted in the activation of antimicrobial peptides in a series of immune response. Turns out this is highly conserved throughout the multicellular phylogeny, and therefore it's an innate mechanism responding to invading infection. Next slide. Because we all know now that there's innate and adaptive immunity, where adaptive immunity are the long-term memory cells, T cell, B cell, that recognize, again, invading organisms through the activation of the receptors. Next slide. So how does this all translate to the human application? Next slide. What you see here is the application of immune immunology in health and human disease, vaccination, immune enhanced therapy, suppression of immunotherapies, uh, that is for transplantation, et cetera, monoclonal antibody and cancer immunotherapy. Next slide. What you see here, of course, is what sort of got, again, another set of Nobel Prize that have saved lives through cancer immunotherapy, Ellison and Hanjo. What they're able to demonstrate is the checkpoint proteins which are released by cancer to suppress immuno, the immune mechanism, PD-1 and the CTLA-4. By using monoclonal antibodies against those checkpoints, they've activated the immune mechanism 
enabling them, therefore, to attack cancer cells. And more recently, CAR T and T cell receptor adaptive cell transfer is yet another one. So now you can see how basic research has greatly improved lives. Next slide. Then come CRISPR, another immune mechanism from bacteria, which is first described as just a sequence of repeated interspace palynthropic repeats in E. coli, but later on, Harvage and Barango found, in fact, what it was is an adaptive immune mechanism. Because what it allows it to do is to recognize viruses and plasma which has invaded the bacteria by actually using Cas mechanism to uh, recognize the sequence through CRISPR. And then the next time when you have such an invading mechanism, the Cas mechanism can actually therefore interrupt the, uh, the uh, asserted uh, viruses and plasmids. Next slide. And of course, all of you know that this year, Jennifer Dauder at Charpentier won Nobel Prize by being able to take this fundamental observation in bacteria and then to simplify the mechanism by creating a single synthetic guide, the guide uh, RNA, which allows you to target any part of a human genome, marine genome, and then using Cas as endonuclease to clip off that sequence, and hence editing. And of course, Feng Zhang from MIT applied it to human and mammalian systems. Next slide. Now you can all imagine the usefulness of human, human genome editing. Next slide. And of course, the application can be somatic or germline. Germline in looking at genetic diseases as inherited from one or both parents, such as cystic fibrosis, uh, you know, and Huntington's and others, that when you're able to do germline, that is from the embryo, uh, being able to gene edit the disease gene, you'll be able to prevent the inheritance of this disease to the children and subsequent you know, uh, progenies. And of course, this will be in many ways preventive if not cured of disease. And it can certainly also the ability to possibly make, you know, uh, enhance human traits, which is in fact uh, designer babies, which is highly controversial. But the application of somatic therapy had been shown to use to work in HIV, for example, the, T the HIV enters T cells to CCL5 receptor <clears throat> and enabled the T cells to be uh, injured, if you will, impaired. And by actually gene editing CCL5 and T cells, HIG patients in clinical trials, still in the phase two, phase three, you're able to greatly reduce the need for triple therapy uh, for treating HIV. It has the possibility of curing blood disorders using in fact stem cell uh, therapy by therefore using uh, gene editing of those cells for sickle cell disease and thalassemia. Next slide. In our laboratory, we've been interested in hypertension. And remember I tell you about the angiotensinal gene, which is made in the liver. But what we did is we took animals with a genetic hypertension called SHRs, shown on the left side, and gene editing through AAV8 vector to directly um, target to liver cells. And in so doing, we edited the angiotensinal gene, which rendered it inactive. And you can see that in the loose bars are the hypertensive animals, 180 millis of pressure, and the yellow bars are the ones of which end animals with gene editing. We have now reduced blood pressure substantially. Not only that, if you were to give it to a young uh, SHL, uh, in fact, in this case, female, but it was same as male, and you look at what happens to developed blood pressure, you can prevent developed blood pressure. So somatic therapy, not without germline can even cure hypertension, which is very exciting. Next slide. Then finally, I'd like to say a word about regeneration. Stem cells, iPS cells, direct reprogrammed tissue engineering. And of course, Yamanaka made the breakthrough observation that you can take a somatic cell and then reprogram it to become induced or pluripotent stem cell called iPS. Thereby, you can use the cell to regenerate or to differentiate to any tissue that you want. Next slide. 
And of course, in the neural area where many of the scientists are present in this meeting, this very important paper published in the Journal of Medicine demonstrated that it's possible to take neutrophils from a patient with Parkinson's disease and reprogram to the iPS cells and then partially differentiate to progenitor dop dopaminergic progenitor cells, put it into putainment of a patient with Parkinson's, same patient with Parkinson's disease. As you can see in the right-hand corner, in fact, the improvement over time of symptoms and motor behavior. Even though this is one case study, it really shows that from basic science, you can possibly, you know, greatly improve diseases which are not improvable. Next slide, not treatable. Finally, I want to tell you about one other area that our laboratory is working on, which is trying to reprogram somatic cells directly to somatic cells rather than through IPS. And next slide. And what we derive this thinking is based on the fact that we now know from zebrafish all the microRNAs that's important in cardiac regeneration, shown this slide. And therefore, knowing the microRNA, we decided to say, can we find a program microRNA that can reprogram a fibroblast to cardiomyocytes? Therefore, when you have cardiac injury or heart failure, you can turn the scar cells into muscle cells. Next slide. To make a long story short, uh, this is the idea to inject these microRNA using a AV vector to, in fact, into the area of injury and convert fibroblasts from scar tissue into cardiomyocytes. Next slide. And of course, we have published many such results showing you it uses lineage tracing on the left side that if you use a fibroblast promoter driving tomato expression, all cells derived from fibroblast lineage will become tomato color. And here, after myocardial infarction shown on the right uh, slide, um, you can see that there are cardiomyocytes, which are regenerated, which is green, because it's staining of sarcomeric protein. But then you also see lots of cells coming from fibroblast lineage, which means we have converted this over to cardiomyocytes. And the bottom, what you can see, is these cells behave in an ex vivo fashion with action potential contractility like a normal cell. And on the right side of the slide, you can see a reduction in fibrosis and improvement in cardiac function. Next slide. So what I've shown you today is many evidence that basic research, even in research in nature, can actually be translated eventually into improvement in human therapy and diagnosis. And in the area of neuro, you have now tremendous amount of advances, neurogenetics, brain mapping, neuroimaging, up to genetics, new technology, cell gene therapy. Next slide, my last slide. Consequently, what you see is now the ability to bring all these basic discoveries and technologies together called convergence, to be able to move from single understanding gene locus to protein networks, to cellular structures, to the ability to look at fundamental networks, circuits in the brain, to influencing behavior and outcomes. So this is a very exciting evidence that basic research can lead to improvement in human lives. Now my last slide, please. So in summary, what I've said about is significant advance in human health has stemmed from basic research. Going forward, we'd like to see even more breakthroughs in human application rising from observation research on nature. And basic science will lead to better lives through important discoveries that will transform health and medicine. Thank you very much.